thank you uh, so much to the Health um, uh, Center and to Javier for, that, for uh, inviting me. For getting for making it easy. So uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about a uh, big collective project and also uh, my uh, specific argument. And so I guess the um, uh, question I want to ask is about how the international gets constructed. So how do we know the international when we see it? So I was renewing my Canadian passport. Today. And in front of me there was a woman with blue hair, like smurf blue hair. And the passport agent said, uh, I'm not putting blue down as your hair color. <laughs> and she said, is my hair not blue? And he said, yes, your hair is blue, but I'm not putting it down. And she said, why not? And uh, he said, well, it's not your natural hair color. So she said, are you going to ask every woman in this room what their natural hair color is? <laughs> and he said, no, but I'm still not putting it down. And so then there was a kind of an, an impasse. Her hair was blue. It wasn't going to go in the passport. And it occurred to me that there was something really interesting going on here about the solidification of that document the solidification of that identity, what it means to have an international identity. Because the woman was afraid that she was going to get a passport that didn't look like her, that didn't reflect her, like what her way of being in the world was. And the passport agent was equally worried that that passport would look stupid because it said that she had blue hair when clearly no one has blue hair for five years. And so they were both made anxious. The slips, the cracks in the system were evident because this document is stable, because it's meant to be an international document. And so um, uh, in my earlier work, uh, I tried to look at the passport as a solution to a set of problems, you know, like in a Foucauldian sense. So why does the government use this tool? Well, it helps solidify identity, it does something with biometrics, it helps with health, you know, it operates in all these ways. But what I've uh, been trying to do in this latest project is to see how these different things, the different objects, create the international, really construct a different domain of politics than the national. And so one of the places that we do that most often, as you know, like as everyone in this room knows, is at the border. And so what I want to do is I want to sort of slightly displace the normal question we ask, which is where is the border, or what does the border do? And ask how the border works. And so we say, let's not just admit the kind of the pragmatics of the border and say it exists. There's a difference between them over there and us over here. And however you want to describe that difference. But say, how do the actual material practices, how do the ideas, how do they operate together? to create this political environment. And so, like, just to start us off so that we're all on the same page, I would say that borders essentially do three things, right? First of all is that they unite. Uh, lots of the anthropological or humanities literature talks about borderlands. So how does the border bring together people? Every border creates differences. Those differences are useful to somebody or another, either in the market sense or in the political sense or in the identity sense. So borders unite. And they also separate. It gives you a way to say, no, this is the law on this side, that's the law on this side. This is the price on this side, that's the price on this side. This is the right on this side, this is the rights on that side. And then the way that I would sort of like push us is to say that that's a good starting place, but how do we know those things about the uniting and the dividing? It's not because there's an established stable meaning that gets established for all time and then we all accept it but rather that meaning is continually performed. Now, I know that you're all, in, you know, like you're all in sexy theoretical ground, right? You're on the humanities, and so this notion of performance is not a challenge for you. But Ben will attest that talking to political scientists about performativity <laughs> is like pushing a rock up a hill. So like, I'm going to push against the open door, which is this exciting crowd, and just sort of say performativity, and I know that you all know but if during the question and answer you say, Mark, I know way more about performativity than you, and you're using it wrong, please feel free to uh, correct So within international relations, the, um, uh, the area that I come from, we focus on sovereignty. Sovereignty is like the key signifier. If you say, you know, like, what's sociology about the social, what's, you know, literature about 
expression or narrative, what is science about stuff, you know, like IR is about sovereignty. And one of the primary ways that we think about sovereignty is uh, as Rob Walker, um, uh, a friend and former teacher of both Ben and I, is he talks about it as a, a border, a boundary, and a limit. And he says that sovereignty is the way that the modern world is constituted. That it's a particular modern political project that says sovereignty is a global organizing principle. It says that within the sovereign state, a particular kind of politics is possible. You can have the good life. You can have progress. You can have democracy. You can have authority. You can have responsibility. And then between sovereign states, nothing. It's anarchy. It's organization that's temporary, it's international law, it's other stuff. So within the state, there's a different political project than between states. So we can never get to like cosmopolitanism because this idea of sovereignty is just so stuck in our political imagination. And that's what IR does. IR takes the world and say, it is a set of sovereign states. No matter how that sovereignty is moving and shaping, that's what it is. And so, there's a reason why Agamben becomes like the sexy theorist, in, you know, like over the past 10 years. It's because Agamben goes back to Schmidt and says, the important thing about sovereignty is not just the dividing, but it's about the decision, right? So Agamben invokes uh, Carl Schmidt, who says, sovereign is he who decides the exception. And so lots of political theorists, and anthropologists, and others have talked about this, but let me give you my take. So, Schmidt says that the most important thing about sovereignty is not just, the, um, not just the expression in law, but rather the expression that there is a normal state of politics in which law can exist. So there's kind of a predicate declaration before there's any law. And so what Agamben says is that's what we should be focusing on, because the problem with the discussion about the war on terror, or about the refugee camps at Sun Gaps, or Wumera, or here on the US-Mexico border. The problem with all of that is it misses the inherent violence in that predicate decision to say either this is normal politics, or this is exceptional politics. Because when there's exceptional politics, the law is suspended. The state, the sovereign, still acts, but it doesn't act according to its own law. So Agamemnon says, whenever you see law, you can be comforted, but you're wrong. The thing that's most important about the sovereign voice is that predicate decision. So you can see how this really works well for IR, right? Like IR thinks that we're all about sovereignty, and that sovereignty is about borders, boundaries, and limits. And so then Agamemnon says, it's not just about borders, boundaries, it's about the capacity to have politics. And so there's a predicate decision that is about whether or not politics can take place. And so, um, I, I, like, there are problems with the government, as I'm sure you all know. Like, he's a little bit of a downer. You know, where if, if Foucault always allows for the possibility of resistance and says that within every power there is a power that circulates, uh, Agamben doesn't seem to have any place for that. Right? And so particularly in things like home or soccer or in state of emergency, there's no place where he sort of says, oh, the people will rise up. In fact, if you look at means, um, uh, it means beyond politics, like he says the refugee is the signal political figure of our age. Why? Because it's abject. The figure of the refugee is abject. And so he thinks that that will kind of radically repoliticize us. Now, uh, I've made the argument uh, elsewhere that I would push this and say that if we're serious about a government, then what we should do is realize that a government has a lot of explanatory power at the border. Because at the border, when we go through that momentary 30 to 60 second examination, we are in a state of exception. There is no law that adheres to us in that moment. That, the, that all that is expressed is the power of that petty sovereign to decide whether or not we are admissible or not. And so we have mostly, you know, like we, you know, like scholars have mostly forgotten that raw state of objection. And like when I came across the border yesterday, I flashed through in 30 seconds. The guy said, what do you do? I said, I'm a professor. He went, okay. And that was it. You know, like I went through a state of objection in which my claim could have been rejected, and I didn't notice because I'm, well, I'm a 
bearded white guy, and I've done this before, and I'm an expert, but it's because I'm so used to the idea that this protects me somehow, that this gives me a claim that I've forgotten that state of attraction. And so I think that a goblin is actually really important for problematizing. But the problem with this line of thinking in international relations is that it focuses on that decision, that ban, that primary political relationship. It doesn't look at intra-political relationships, relationships between different polities. So Gombin himself, like it's not his fault, you know, like he's got other, he's got other fish to fry, right? But like he's not an international theorist. He's not interested in the international. He's not interested in any of those politics. And so he just doesn't have anything to say about them. And I would say that presents a real, uh, that presents a real problem. But what it means is that we've come up to this point, I would say, at the limit of our use, the limit of Agamemnon's utility for international relations. Because we've now theorized up to that point of decision and ban, and we can't do any more. Because Agamemnon doesn't give us any tools to talk about how those different bands relate to one another or how might one negotiate rights, responsibilities, or identity across that band, across that threshold. So we need something else. And so, um, uh, you know, like, uh, like many of us, I started out when I was young and I read, you know, like Plato and Socrates and thought that was it. And then, I remember in fourth year, someone giving me some Derrida, Plato's Pharmacon, you know, like, and saying that, you know, and I said, well, this is terrible. And someone said, you're right, you never have to read postmodernism again. And then by the end of my <laughs> MA, I was all into Foucault, and I was good at explaining to people why I was reading about sexuality when I was in international relations. And then, like everybody, I got mostly bored with discourse only and started looking at other things and so started moving to Bourdieu. I could just work our way through the French theorists, right? You know, like <laughs> Bourdieu and looking at practice. And now, you know, the limits of practice, uh, we turn to the tour. And so one of the things that I want to look at is the way that the things, the actual objects, can give us a way out of this dead end in international religion. And so if IR is a science of sovereignty, then actor network theory can be understood as kind of a science of connection, a way of understanding with an open mind how things connect. And so uh, Latour said the problem with sociologists, amongst the problem with sociologists, one of them is that they're always looking for the social. And he says when they do, they find it. And then the social becomes this catch-all category that explains everything. And so he says, rather than make the presupposition about the social or about the people, then what we should do is we should find out what the connections really are in particular matters of fact and matters of controversy. And so uh, the book that uh, I'll talk about in a second is called Making Things International. That's a clear homage to uh, Latour and, um, uh, and Weevil's Making Things Public, which was this, you know, like a big doorstop of the book. And so what um, uh, Latour gives us two real provocations in, when he talks about ding politics again, real politics. First of all, he says, we want to render the world as flat as possible. So rather than give priority to those things that we already think we know have power, that we should actually be really sober with power as an explanatory variable. That we should really sort of be rigorously open and see what connections actually get made within particular controversies or in particular sites. And so Michel Cadell is one of the ones, uh, one of the other uh, ANT theorists that I find particularly useful. And um, uh, he talks about this doctrine of uh, free association. I know, every, uh, like everybody's doing psychoanalysis, so free association. <laughs> the observer should abandon all a prior distinction between the natural and the social. Lots of these things come from science and technology studies, so they're really interested in how do scientific facts arise. They're not discovered, but rather they're constructed and put together, put together in particular environments, with particular investments, with particular machinery, in particular genres. So 
like uh, as Le, uh, uh, Latour says in uh, the introduction to making things public, we should be able to do that for politics as well. We should look at political facts, not as something that you discover, but as something that's created, something that's constructed, something that uses tools, something that gets presented and then represented. And so he said, and so Canal, I think, poses a really huge challenge to international relations. He says, instead of imposing a pre-established grid of analyses, the observer should follow the actors. Well, that really screws up, up the justification for international relations. The reason why I do international relations and not political science or sociology or anthropology is because I think sovereignty is important. And I think that sovereignty as a grid of analysis tells us something really fundamental about the world and about the limits of politics. And Calon's telling me to forget that. And he's got a whole bunch of really good examples about what, how much good, useful, interesting analysis you can do when you forget it. And so this is the, what I think, very productive tension that we can find when we put actor network theory together with sovereignty, uh, with international relations. Because the problem with flat ontology is when you sort of say everything, ha uh, everything has the potential to have equal weight, then you end up with really weak explanatory things like talking about trials of strength. So why do some ideas win over others, or some connections win over others, trials of strength. But that's, maybe it's because I, you know, like, um, I've read too much Foucault, but that's not satisfying as an answer. Like, there was a trial of strength, and then this one was bigger, and it won. Like, I don't understand that. Bourdieu helps, right? Because Bourdieu can talk about different kinds of capital. But again, when Bourdieu talks about different kinds of capital, he's talking about particular fields which are pre-given and pre-established. And so that screws up the Calon part. So sovereignty can really help us, because sovereignty is all about the definition of limits. And so how different ideas and politics can either stick within a particular space or what happens when they transcend spaces. And so border studies, I think, is a particularly uh, good lens to get to this integration um, uh, of IR and actor network theory through. So this, I, I will admit, is one of my favorite uh, images. Poor Ben has probably seen this more than once. <clears throat> and it's a um, border post from the U.S. Canada border, right? And it says, if you arrive during unstaffed hours, report to the video camera. Wow, like that's, you know, that's brilliant on several levels, right? <laughs> and it tells you something about the way that you as a traveler are interpolated into a system, not just of surveillance, but control. And also, like, you know, what Foucault talks about, the confessionary complex, that you do report to the video camera. And you report well to the video camera, right? You stand in front of it, you adjust your tie, you have your story ready. Like, you are there reporting to the video camera as if it were a person. And so this helps me connect the IR stuff about decision and exceptionality and the border studies work on performativity and that instantiation of sovereignty, that sovereignty isn't just an abstract legal thing, but it's a series of decisions that happen over and over again in which both sides are complicit, right? Both the border guard and the border crosser and the illegal border crosser are all implicit. And it also helps me connect that actor network theory stuff that says objects have agency. That objects, even though they don't have intentionality, even they don't have consciousness, they still affect the political space in which particular controversies arise. And so to give one sort of brief example, there was a um, uh, guy on the Canadian side of the border who took an ax and drove across the border and then chopped somebody up on the American side and then drove back again through one of these unintended posts. And people said, well, this is clearly a failure of border security. And someone kind of said, no, it's not. Like, you can drive an ax across the border and it's not actually the border guard's job to detect whether or not you're a murderer or even an axe murderer. Like that's not within their but that's not within their mandate. And it's not about the video camera. It's not like, oh well, if you had a better video camera, we would have seen the murderous glint in his eye. <laughs> you know, like and so there's a way in which that particular assembly, that particular controversy calls up both the lines of responsibility and authority and also the gaps in those lines of responsibility that are constituted by the border and made possible by this socio-technical um, instantiation. So I don't want to steal uh, Ben Slender. I know that um, uh, he's already uh, given you his talk on Avatar. Ben has an excellent chapter in this uh, book on Avatar. 
is on the right. Um, uh, I simply want to point to the fact that here is another specific, really great example of the way that the technology is acting, right? And that the action of that technology exceeds any human intentionality, right? I think that that's one of the points that is really useful about the new materialism actor network theory is to say rather than try to reduce all socio-technical networks to intentionality, mistake, risk calculation, that we actually, that the flatter ontology gives us permission to say what are the actual effects and connections of this particular assembly without making the presupposition that humans are the most important part or the best part or the part where the decision lies. Because it seems to me that, that uh, ben makes this point better than I do. It seems to me that there are some decisions that happen in here that are not the intention of the designer. So I'm, can I tell your story? Mm -hmm. So Ben asked the question, probably in a room very much like this, what about racism? Or I'm sure you said it in a much more polite <laughs> way than that. But it's like, what about the dynamics of race in this particular encounter between the machine and the individual? And the d developers respond, oh no, you can make the border guard whatever race you want it to appear. It's just that we find that we get more truthful interactions when the border guard is white than male. <laughs> right? So let's be generous and say that they're not being actively <laughs> racist. Right? Like, I mean, let's say that they're not. Let's be generous and... and Right? Let's just for it. just trying to detect deception. It's a thought experiment, right? Let's pretend that they're not being uh, that they're not being right. But that doesn't stop that machine and that particular instantiation of that decision having this effect of normalizing that set of powers. And so, while there are lines of responsibility, if we focus on the responsibility, then we go down an ethical then we go down an ethical rabbit hole that that makes us less politically effective rather than if we say, this machine has a racist effect. Does that make sense? And so it seems to me that if part of our mandate is to be politically engaged and releasing ourselves of the lodestone of human intentionality actually does us a lot of favors. It actually means that we can point more different fingers in different ways. <coughs> so I'm going to say, how can I ask a different question? about responsibility and authority that's not simply reduced to human agency. And so one of the, way, uh, one of the ways that I want to do this is um, uh, I talk about the metaphor of the suture. Like part of it is because, you know, uh, I was young, I read Zizek, happens to lots of us. You know, like, and, you know, Zizek talks about the, the suture in film theory, talking about the way that the film includes you in the audience, the way that the film kind of sucks you in and makes you part of the film world. And then, you know, like there's lots of good psychoanalytic stuff about the, the suture and the, uh, and the abject. And it seems to me that that's a really good way of understanding how the border and bordering works. So, the, uh, you know, the process of suturing is that whatever the initial injury is, the suture are the stitches that bring together the two sides, that put the two sides in communication, that lead to their knitting together. It's not a direct cause. It's not like if you get a stitch, these two come together. Because it turns out that they don't. But it's a really good way of disaggregating the exterior force by which two practices or two you know, sides are brought together. And then empowers a particular set of knittings together that are not predetermined, that are not pre-given by their externalities. And so it seems to me that that's super useful when we talk about border studies. Because there is a border between New Mexico and Arizona on the border between Mexico and the United States. And there is no necessity why those two would have to be different, and yet they are. And so there's something about the structure of the border that puts two sides in parallel, but the actual practice of materiality leads to different instantiations of the border. Ben and I work on uh, you know border studies, and we go to lots of, you know, like lots of border studies meetings, and they're like, there's hilarious conversations every time when you say, what are you doing at the U.S. border? Oh, it's awesome. We're doing drones, Apache helicopters, no military, or rather there's military, but they don't engage in kinetic activity, so it's fine. What are you doing at the Canadian border? Drones? Oh, anything else? No, it's fine. Really? Oh, no, we're going to put on all those things. So you say, why? Why are you trying to protect 
an Eric uh, Michigan from the great white north threat. There's 20 people that cross every year legally. <laughs> They're pretty bad, I guess, versus the U.S.-Mexico border. Right? And so like that, that's one of those cases where the two sides are in tension. And even though there's the same structural resources available, different things together happen. So I'm going to um, uh, ask the um, uh, question through the lens of object that puts both of those things together, that borders both divide and connect. And so it seems to me, and I use um, uh, John Law and Anne-Marie Ball's discussion of train accidents to talk about local entanglements rather than utopian or sovereign. So I think one of the problems with international relations, uh, as represented by Rob, particularly in the after the globe, before the world, is that he's got this really universal view. Like he wants to say that sovereignty is the kind of like global signifier of the limits of the modern political imagination, and then there's lots of kind of particular instances. And the advantage of actor network theory is that there are lots of really specific incidents, this sheet, that pump, this, these scallops, but nothing big. And so I think that by putting these two in conversation, then maybe we can get at the way that sovereignty acts as a limit to the modern political imagination while still being grounded in really very specific empirical local intelligence. So this seems to me to be a really great uh, map of the problem. Right? Both in the sense of like what the actual problem is here on the ground, but also the problems in their representation. So what does this do? This calls us to action about the migrant deaths, but only on this side of the board. Now why is that? Why is it that this, uh, why is it, oh now I do want the laser pointing, right? Like why is it that there are no deaths south of the border on this map? It's because of an inherent assumption that what happens south of the border is not our problem that what happens south of the border is now not ours to name and not ours to act upon. That that is the responsibility, that is the authority, that's under another sovereign, and so that has nothing to do with us. And if this is the humanitarian version, then this is the security version. It's the same thing. There is nothing in the SBI net sort of mapping of this human security assemblage that has anything to do with the other side of the border, even though we all I think we all agree that lots of the effort that takes place to create a secure border is about offshoring the border of problems. It's about not just communication, not just about infrastructure that communicates, but it's also about intelligence sharing. It's about deterring people from, you know, like Nicaragua and Colombia from making the trip. It's about stopping the train, you know, like all of those, all of those things. And so both of these maps represent like, the problem and the solution, right? They represent the problem and they retain sovereignty as their underlying guiding principle that connects it to political accountability. So why, so I can complain, I can complain about the efficiency of this system. And I can say, oh my God, they spent so much money and nothing happened. And that kind of buys into the sovereign idea that I'm only responsible for things that happen in this space. And similarly, I can say, this is terrible, and look at all the actions that I'm taking. You know, like I'm putting water out in the desert, I'm marking these, I've got the, you know, like undocumented migrants app, what's that thing that the, the, um, the border disturbance? No, that little Mingus project, yeah. That's right, that's right. You know, like, so that's all really brilliant and interesting, but, it plays into the same dynamic about sovereignty that says the reason why I'm representing it this way, the reason why I'm engaged in this, is because my politics ended the border. Now, there's something more complicated going on here, because they're saying the politics ended the border, but I will give rights or I will give dignity or respect to those people crossing the border who may be undocumented. And so there is some troubling of that inside-outside boundary, but really, look at that. I mean, to me, the most shocking thing, the most salient thing about this is not just the deaths, it's the absence of the deaths on the other side. Or giving humanity exactly. to... Exactly, right? So there's something really, there's, there's a, that sovereign knot there still hasn't been undone by this kind of representation. 
So uh, I think that that's one of the things that I find so interesting about uh, this new materialist wave. And Jane Bennett does a really good job of explaining this when she talks about the 2003 power of black country. She says, when you look at the complex assemblage of forces that is making up this particular controversy, then we can see that responsibility, there isn't a straight line. We can no longer say, well, it's, well, I don't want to pick on anyone. It's Bush. It's Napolitano. Like, they're the dumbbells who put on the war on drugs, or they're the dingbats that did this, or the, you know, Boeing for screwing up the SBI net. Like, that's not useful as a way of calling to account. I guess that's a bit of Rancière, just to make sure we've covered every. French theorist, right? Like, there's no way of, that, that is an inefficient way of calling to account. And so I think that um, uh, I want to put, like, a couple of, like, new solutions to the test, because it seems to me that there's something really interesting about the way that the um, predator drones are being used versus the boar star. I'm sure that more of you know this off by heart than I do. The border patrol search and rest Search trauma and rescue um, uh, squad. Now that's super, super interesting because their mandate is intelligence-led policing against organized crime. Oh, so is everybody's, right? But then they do all this other stuff, which is search and rescue and how the, to do field, uh, uh, how to do first aid in the field, and how to go into remote areas and how to stop crises. Now that's an interesting subversion of that policing humanitarian that I think we see more and more of in Customs and Border Patrol activity. That they do this, they say, in addition to policing the border, we're also going to care for the life. Right? And so that is, uh, I think that that's something that's kind of interesting. Now, one of the things that I was at this DHS uh, seminar in a few years ago when they invited Canadians. It was clearly a mistake. They haven't done it since. <laughs> they invited Canadians and they sort of said, what do you think? And I said, I think boots on the ground are better than machines. Right? We were talking about SBI nets and how to expand that to the US-Canada border. And they said, why? I said, well, because a person has a legal duty of care. The moment that you see that person in trouble, then it becomes your legal responsibility to do something. You can't just watch and let them die. Whereas if you've got an unattended ground sensor, then you could notice that that person has fallen and doesn't get up, and then that's it. And if you read Joseph Kugelese's article on drones, again in the book, what he points out is that drone operators in Afghanistan and Pakistan do this all the time, that they watch people bleed out. You know, like that they have a drone, they see that the, the first attack, they often come back for a second strike to catch the people who serve the first ones. I'm not saying it's like suicide terrorism, but there's an interesting parallel there between the volley bombings and the drone strikes. And then what do they do? They watch. They watch that person bleed out. Because now, if they were there on the ground, then they'd have to do something. So I make this point to the DHS people, supported by a nice RCMP officer, like it wasn't just me being, you know, like white bearded liberal in a tweed suit bang on. You know, like I sort of said, don't you want more boots on the ground? And he said, boots on the ground are not as cost effective as the drones. So that's the like big signifier of the good, cost effective, absolute security, versus this very local entanglement of when you're on the ground, then you make a gut decision and you have this kind of human empathetic mirror neuron response to say, I know what pain feels like. Have you guys read this interesting stuff about mirror neurons? So this is another sort of like way into the new material stuff. Sorry, I'm going to need to leave in seven minutes. I'll try, to, I'll try to make the last seven minutes good. So if you look at Jane Bennett and um, Bill Connolly's work on new materialism, then they get at this same set of issues, but from a different way. So they go through Spinoza rather than through uh, Latour. But they come to the same place. But Connolly does all this really interesting work on neuroscience. And he says, guess what? You don't think of stuff and then say it. The way the brain works is you say stuff and then you hear yourself speaking and then you go, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> now, isn't that weird? Like, that really screws up our idea of intentionality, right? Like, if you don't formulate the whole thing and then say it, but rather there's some part of you, there's some part of you that's always crashing ahead of you like a wave that is saying, pretty much mostly what you want to say, and then you hear it and agree with yourself, like that's 
really, really interesting. And the same thing with mirror neurons. But when you look at someone, then there are neurons that mimic the thing that you see. So if you get like a freshly hatched baby, and you go, bleh, then the baby goes, bleh. Even though it's never seen a face before, it doesn't know what its own tongue is, there's something in the, in the brain that when you, like fresh baby, like baby I haven't seen anybody, you pick up the baby and go, mm. that's not an experiment I'm encouraging, right? It's like, this is, there are real scientists involved. You know, like, they go, mm. baby goes, mm. Like the bit, can you think of all of the different connections you would need to make to think, I see that face, recognize the face, recognize that it's a face, see the tongue, recognize that it's a tongue, be able to stick out your tongue? Like there's a lot of brain activity that's happening there about others and the self that is entirely pre-conscious. And so there's something interesting in this like, you know, uh, Levinas, Lacan, empathy that we're finding out more about from neuroscience, that some of this stuff seems to be like pre-cognitive or cognitive adjacent or something that I think does something uh, for us. So this is the, uh, this is the, um, uh, this is the big uh, book. Uh, there are two volumes. Despite I tried very hard to get Minnesota Press to issue like one big volume so that it would sit next to making things public on the bookshelf <laughs> and like then you could see whose volume was bigger, but in the end they uh, decided to go for uh, two books. So this is the first volume that um, uh, Ben is in. And there's a chapter on everything that you see here, you know, so traffic lights, shipping containers, um, uh, blood, uh, carbon, bicycles, viruses, cocaine, Tanks, clocks, passports, e-passports, boats, garbage, currency, corpses, viruses, and microbes. And drones. And each of those uh, make, a, make a, a link from that particular empirical site to the creation of the international in ways that I think are really useful. Okay, so uh, I will give you a uh, quick sort of gesture towards um, uh, my chapter. So uh, I look at passport photos and you know, connecting that blue haired girl at the beginning to what this passport uh, photo does. So this is Ahmed Rassam, who was the Millennium Bomber. He tried to, uh, he almost crossed um, uh, the US-Canada border in order to blow up LAX at the Millennium. He was a splinter cell, he was Al-Qaeda before it was cool, they didn't want him, like he wasn't that interesting, so they just gave him some money and he did this mostly by himself, maybe he and another guy. And he got this passport by getting a baptismal certificate, which has no biometric information, and an Université de Quebec student ID card. So, that was an interesting bureaucratic story here. Right? So what happens is Canadian passport says, oh my god, we're never going to let that happen again. So they increase all of the requirements for what you need for a passport, and then everything slows down to a grinding halt as all of a sudden they're phoning guarantors, and they're doing all this kind of stuff, and the system grinds to a halt, and then they have to walk it back and say, we can't possibly guarantee the security of the document, so we're just going to, we're going to walk it back. Now that would be interesting by itself. There's a 1947 report from the British Passport Office that says the same thing. It says, you know, like if you put down the name of a guarantor that's actually a doctor, then you can do it. It's only if you make up the name of a doctor. So if you're really stupid, then we'll catch you. But if you're a little bit crafty, then we can't catch you in terms of like that guarantor. So the passport has all of these nationalist symbols, right? It's an international technology in itself. It's how you know that you're Canadian, right? It's because you have the object, and the object signifies something. You know, the, this object is actually the property of the government of Canada, and there's some interesting law about when they can give it to you or not. It's the same for Americans. You have no right to a passport. Uh, you know, the passport is the privilege of the government, and they can take it away if they want to, and they do. So, Here's the biometric, you know, uh, here's the biometrics, where the, there's the facial biometrics, more about that in a second. And then we've got the new black light, and so we've got all of these nice nationalist symbols. So that's our parliament building and the peace tower, and then those are the fireworks that happen on uh, July the 1st, our July the 4th. Uh, we have July the 4th, it's just not that important. <laughs> 
But what I want to point to is I want to point to this moment in the 1920s when the passport photo solidifies. And so, uh, like before that, passports are just like pieces of paper with names written on them saying, I know Ben, Ben's fine. Please give him all the assistance that he needs as he crosses the Arabian Desert, right? <laughs> but what happens is that in the 1920s, this becomes formalized. So there becomes a standardized form, and all of a sudden, there's a standardized application. And you know, because of the First World War, all of a sudden, you've got all these refugees, and they need places. And so you've got lots of people in motion. There's some super interesting documents, because everybody says, look, we'll have this passport for tops five years, and then we'll go back to the way it used to be, the good old days of the 19th century, when everyone could just wander around. And so it's super interesting how they all downplay the passport, and then it becomes one of the signifiers of contemporary global life. So here's that picture of, um, uh, so this is James Joyce uh, and family. Like, so this is, the, this is the passport from James Joyce and his family. So, like, so first of all, look at the photo. Right? You know, A, he's wearing a hat and glasses, but look, like this is a, a photo of mom and two kids. But look here, this is, the, this is the part that I find so fascinating. Okay, so James Joyce, he's a, an English teacher, I guess. Height, five for 10. And then we get to the super interesting stuff. Forehead, regular. Eyes, blue. Nose, regular. Chin, oval. Complexion, fair. Right, then same thing with his, uh, same thing with his uh, color of hair, right? And look, the kids are just named. So the passport at this moment is fluid, and the, the photograph isn't regularized, and it's not trustworthy. People don't trust that you can read the passport photo in the same way all the time, right? It's not standardized. You've got this family portrait, and they have to have narrative descriptions next to it. So look, here's um, uh, Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, so you can see the way that it changes, right? Here we have it where um, it's uh, a portrait style, 1915, there's a family. By the time we get to F. Scott Fitzgerald, then it's only hair and eyes, because those are the two things you can't tell in a black and white uh, photograph, but it's kind of like, it's stable. This is, I think, one of, uh, this is one of, there's some great stories about this, you know, like some people put in really narrative descriptions. So, you know, their nose is aquiline or Romanesque or their forehead is intelligent, you know, and like <laughs> the people are like scratching those up like regular, normal. There's one woman who like, uh, who has what is described as a dusky complexion. Everybody else is fair, peachy, whiter than white, you know, like it's super interesting. So what? So here's the picture of someone who looks like, to be honest, like my dad. And look, forehead, eye, complexion fair, face round, eyes blue, nose medium. That's a medium nose. Like, that's salt Yeah, exactly. You know, like but everybody thinks that their chin is round, that their forehead, you know, like it's, so I went through all the passport applications for like 1915, 1916. There are like two people who describe their face as something other than oval or normal, or regular, or medium, like everybody looks in the mirror and thinks that they're the same. But what happens is that as the passport comes to replace that narrative, then it has to become more systematic. And so you get things like this, which is the new standard for how passport photographs have to, uh, have to take place. Not just because they're machine readable, but also to standardize them. And so there's some really interesting work about the way that biometric technology works, which Ben knows more about than I do. But um, because the technology isn't that great, you have to have a neutral face. So, in addition to there being like these, in addition to being these like technical things, look at this. I love this. Smiling's not permitted. You can't have any expression on your face because that screws up the biometric. So you have to present a version of your face that you know is not you, right? So that, that presents the fundamental problem of the passport is that now there is, an in, there is a concretization, internalization of the identity which we know is not correct. And again, like not to invoke the last French theorist, right? But this is Lacan's mirror phase all over again, right? Like Lacan talks about the mirror phase where you look at the mirror and you see a version of yourself that's perfect because it doesn't have the doubt that you have. 
Uh, like that's what the passport is doing, right? And you are looking at a version of yourself that never looks like you. Like nobody's passport fairer ever looks like that because you are never in a neutral expression. You are never, even when you're asleep, have the same kind of thing that you have there. So in addition to all the policing of, you know, like race and gender and, you know, like all of that kind of stuff that we would normally attribute there, there's something about, look, the expression, right? So this helps us understand in a very concrete way the way that the state doesn't view us as, inher as inherently belonging, but rather that we are always already alienated. That the passport, in addition to not legally guaranteeing us, never looks like us. Right? And so all of that, all of our claims to belonging and claims to right to entry, those are constructed, those are performed in the moment. Where everybody is convinced that that thing that promises doesn't really promise. And so in that way, it's not just the discourse, it's not just the regulation. It's not even the practice, it's the object itself, it's this photograph that leads us into the local particular ethics of that decision crossing the border. And so it's the passport photo that gives us the solution to the limits of thinking with a goblet and through Walker about sovereignty as a border boundary limit. And so I think that that's the model that I, I think is well represented in this volume about how particular objects and their interrelationship with the international really create, not just the international in a kind of global sense, but all of the millions of instantiations of particular ethical claims about the national and the international.